Hey everybody, um, Mr. Dale, coming to you live from my home office. Well, I, okay, well I guess for you it won't be live, but I'm live right now. Um, I'm going to do the video lecture from last week the, that we were covering Thursday, kind of Friday. Um, just for anybody that missed it so they can get caught up. Um, and then for those of you that are looking for something to do, I, I don't think we got through all the slides in any of my classes. So you could jump ahead to the slide we were on and uh, get caught up from there. With that said, I want to make sure it is abundantly clear that everything I'm going to be doing here over these next few weeks is completely optional. Nobody has to uh, watch any videos. Nobody has to complete any activities. There will be no grades going into the grade book. Um, do not feel pressured to jump in and, and start doing this stuff. The last thing I want to do is add stress to anybody's life right now because I, I'm sure a lot of you are feeling anxious and maybe a little cooped up and to throw the stress of school on top of that isn't fair. With that said, if you know you, you think some of this might be a little fun, if you want to see if I crack some jokes, if I say something silly, um, by all means, this is for you. I'm trying to give you guys a break from the monotony of sitting at home, watching TikTok and playing video games or whatever you're doing to pass the time. Um, and I figured, you know, some some light econ related stuff might be helpful. Um, those of you that took the survey, thank you so much. I'm going to leave it up. If you know people that might want to see me create some content, direct them to the survey. I'm not 100% sure what I'm allowed to do and what I'm not allowed to do. So like the Kahoot game, um, I'm going to try, but I, it, the logistics of having everyone logged in at the same time is difficult. And then there's um, some concerns where I'll have to get approval, I believe, but I'm going to try. Um, the current event stuff seemed really popular. Uh, I'm going to look into making some videos. I actually already started making one talking about the Federal Reserve and doing some review from Unit 5. I'm planning on posting it, but I want to make sure that it's it's accurate information, it's good information, it's sending a positive message. So it might take me a few days to get that one put together. Um, probably won't do many guided notes and video lectures. Um, in like the vein of what we typically do in class, simply because, uh, like I said, this is optional stuff, guys. So I don't want to start pushing into new content and then have like half of you at one point, half of you at another. Uh, it just doesn't seem fair. So I might do some like video lectures on review and maybe some video lectures on stuff outside the scope of what we were going to cover in class, maybe go a little more in depth on some of the stuff we, we skipped through. Um, for the sake of time earlier in the year. But again, it's all going to be optional. Um, what else? Oh, the economic simulation where we're going to make the fake city. I don't know if we'll have enough students to do it by class, but I think we'll have enough to where we could, like, as, as an entire group, run a city. So I might try and get that up and running. Um, I think after I record this, I'm going to record a video of the game and just kind of show you like what we'll be doing and then maybe put together a small survey for you guys to vote on like what we'll name the city, what kind of industries we're going to build. Um, and we'll just take take that as we go. This is new for all of us, so you'll have to bear with me if I make some mistakes or it's uh, a little bit bumpier than we would hope. <clears throat> so on that note, let's go ahead and jump into the lecture. This is, again, what we were covering at the end of last week. And since things got disrupted and some classes were only able to get so far and some were able to get to a different point, I'll go ahead and do the whole lecture. And um, if you don't have guided notes, they're available. Unit 9, um, Lesson 1, the guided notes are there. So you can download them, print them off, just use them um, to type in the correct notes, and we'll go from there. All right. So... <laughs> <laughs> Monopolies, guys, super, super interesting from an economic standpoint. If you think back to the beginning of last week, we were talking about purely competitive markets, markets where you have a lot of small firms who have very little control over the price, where the market is dictating the price, and firms can easily enter and exit the market. Monopolies are essentially the opposite of that. There's one firm, one really big firm, and there's a lot of barriers to entry that would prevent a competitor from sprouting up and taking market share from that monopoly. So let's talk characteristics of monopoly. We are going to see a lot of dice, play money, lots and lots of play money. There's this game board that's um, pretty integral to the monopoly, and then everybody has some game pieces. You guys laughing? 
Listen, this joke, for those of you that weren't here, this joke crushed it in class. Crushed it. Like, kids were rolling. Teachers were poking their head in to see what was happening. It's legendary. It's not a dad joke. It's going to go down in history as one of the greatest teacher jokes of all time. Characteristics of Monopoly. So there really, there are some characteristics we need to think about. A Monopoly, again, has one big seller. That's what's inherent to all Monopolies. And this gives them a lot of control over how much stuff to produce and what price to charge for that stuff. Another characteristic of every Monopoly is that they are selling a single unique product in which there is no readily available alternative. So if you think back to our market structure simulation, in the purely competitive market, I went up to a supplier. If they were asking for two Leia loot, I just went to the next one because I knew eventually one of you would be charging one. And a Monopoly, they don't have that, that, like buyers don't have that option. You walk up to the monopolist and say, what are you charging? And there isn't another competitor to go talk to for price. So it's either you pay that price or you don't get the products. So monopolists get a pretty, pretty, uh, they have a pretty bad stigma associated with their name. Um, and the reason why that is, is because of their control over price. If a monopolist wants to charge a higher price, they're able to do so. So for this reason, uh, the United States, along with many other developed nations have outlawed some monopolistic practices and tend to try and regulate monopolies uh, when they sprout up. Now you might be asking yourself, why can a monopoly exist? Like what are these barriers to entry that make it so difficult for a competitor to come in and just charge a lower price? It starts with this idea of economies of scale. And to understand economies of scale, we're gonna work through an analogy. Bear with me on this one. But let's say we all as a class took a field trip to watch a sumo wrestling match, okay? And we, we walk in there and two guys walk out, all right? The first guy is five foot one, may, weighs maybe 105 pounds. Nothing wrong with being, being a small guy like that, but that's who he is, right? And we're like, okay, all right, let's see what this guy's got. And then the door opens up, some smoke comes out, like a WWE wrestler, right? They start playing music. And here comes this six foot eight, 450 pound behemoth of a man. Who are you gonna who would you think would win in that sumo wrestling match? The bigger guy. Being big in a sumo wrestling match gives you a really big advantage. And the same thing is true in markets with a lot of economies of scale. It's the idea that the bigger you get the more advantages you have. So why are economies of scale a thing? It starts with the initial or fixed costs that a company would have to, uh, have to invest to compete in the market. On the last slide, we had Envy Energy, the local energy company. Think for a moment if we wanted to compete with Envy Energy, what would we have to do? Well, first, we'd need a source of power, so we'd have to build, like, a Hoover Dam that generates hydroelectric power, or we'd have to build a nuclear power plant and get it all approved and regulated and find a source of uranium, or we'd have to build a solar plant and find a location that's constantly sunny and invest in those solar panels that can turn with the rotation of the sun, or turn as the sun goes across the sky, I should say, the rotation of the Earth. Um, it would be really, really expensive. In order for it to be worth our time, we'd have to be able to sell our electricity to a lot of consumers. And the truth is, it's just really, really difficult to get that kind of market share. So big companies are able to spread those initial costs, those initial fixed costs, across a lot of sales to smaller consumers, which makes like the per unit sale, or the per unit cost smaller, right? Because you're saying, all right, so the, the um, the variable cost is maybe 10 cents to drive solar power. The fixed cost was $2 million. So if you sell to one consumer, your average cost is $2 million and 10 cents. If you sell to two consumers, your average cost is $1 million and 10 cents. And that price per unit keeps getting pushed down. So in markets with a lot of economies of scale, where it's really, really advantageous to get really, really big, um, you can sometimes end up with what's known as a natural monopoly. And a natural monopoly, the logic is that the most efficient way to run the market is with one big firm. Some people put energy in that category, although as the news has shown you in, in recent years, a lot of people also think that maybe we want competing energy companies here in Nevada. Uh, another really good example would be water. Think about water for a minute. If 
we as a class wanted to set up a water company to compete with the water district, we'd have to buy up a bunch of land, lay a bunch of pipes, find a water source, find a way to sanitize the water, find a way to store the water, pressurize the system. Uh, anytime we wanted to hook up a new customer, we'd have to pay a plumber to go out there and like switch a bunch of plumbing to plug into our water system. It just wouldn't make sense. So in most regions, we've decided that it's just logical to have one water company. It's a natural monopoly. So when you have a natural monopoly, the government usually wants to get involved. And they'll say, okay, we're going to give you a monopoly on water within a geographic area, say Las Vegas. The government ensures that resources aren't wasted by having a bunch of competing water companies set up shop, buying a bunch of, uh, bunch of land, tearing up a bunch of land, building a bunch of different water, sa water sanitation places. Um, and in exchange for protecting the one monopoly from competition, the monopoly agrees to certain restrictions and regulations, usually surrounding price, but it also might relate to like the technology they use, um, as is the case with MB Energy and Green Energy, or like other, other types of initiatives. Speaking of technology, it's got a, an interesting relationship with natural monopolies. So. I'm going to tell you guys a story when I was in elementary school to like early middle school, right? When I wanted to make a phone call to a friend, I would have to come home from school and I would have to use a landline. I don't, I don't know how many of you have a landline in your house, but it, it's like the, the phone that plugs into the wall, right? Like you can't just take it and leave. You have to use it either right there connected to the wall or in some cases they had like a wireless receiver where you could pick up the phone and maybe walk around the house but that was it that was it guys that was how we made phone calls and for that system to work a company had to set up telephone wires that ran throughout the city and they plugged into a, a central point and that central point could connect phone calls across the country this is why when you heard about like long distance calling being an issue um, it's because it was really expensive to set up the infrastructure to make a call from say Las Vegas to Chicago in the late 90s early 2000s a technology took off that totally disrupted the telephone market and that's cell phones now instead of having to buy all this land and running telephone wires all over the place you could simply install a tower and that tower could cover a huge region AT&T may have been set up as a natural monopoly, a regional monopoly for, let's say, Las Vegas, but then all of a sudden Verizon could come in, build a tower, and compete with AT&T. Singular could come in and compete with AT&T. T-Mobile could come in and compete with AT&T. And seemingly overnight, what was once considered a natural monopoly now had a bunch of competition sprouting up. So the government plays a really big role in monopolies. Um, on one end of it, they're regulating it and keeping track of it. On another end of it, in a, on occasion, they'll actually create monopolies. They'll set up artificial barriers to prevent other companies from competing within a particular market. And this is what's known as a government monopoly. Natural monopolies and government monopolies are not mutually exclusive because a lot of times, as is the case with MB Energy, there will be a natural monopoly and the, governor, uh, the government will come in and create artificial barriers that prevent other energy companies from competing. Um, and then, as we see with technology, that can sometimes change over time and, you know, the, the monopoly still exists because the government is protecting it, even though it's no longer a natural monopoly. Another type of monopoly to consider is the technological monopoly. Now, there, there's two types here. Um, the first is a technological monopoly that exists without a patent, and that would be like Google search algorithm, for example. It is so complex and so intricate that no one person really understands it. It's a huge technological advantage within the company, and no matter how much a Microsoft or a Yahoo tries to compete or a DuckDuckGo, um, they really haven't been able to break through that market to a degree to where we, we would say um, it's an oligopoly. The other type of techno technological monopoly is one that's actually granted and protected by the federal government, and that would be in the case of a patent. So let's say uh, I develop some type of new pharmaceutical drug, a uh, foot fungus drug, right? What I would do is I would go down and patent that formula, the chemistry behind the drug, 
And the government would say, okay, in effect, for 20 years, you're the only person or the only company will allow to produce your new pharmaceutical drug. And in exchange for this protection of ensuring that no other company can compete with you, at the end of 20 years, that becomes available to the public. And that's what would happen, right? At 20 years, you would have my foot fungus drug and then a whole bunch of generics, as they're called, creating a, a, a copy of my foot fungus drug. Another good example of a monopoly is franchises and licensees or licenses. Um, when you hear the word franchise, you probably think of like a McDonald's, which is good. That's a good example of a regional monopoly that can be constructed. If I wanted to start a hamburger joint, I might go to McDonald's and say, hey, I want to sling some hamburgers. I want to do it under the McDonald's brand. And they might in turn say, okay will let you use the McDonald's brand and be the only one that does it throughout all of Las Vegas. And a lot of companies do this. <coughs> Pardon me. Uh, another type of franchise that gets set up would be like the national parks. The national parks will go out and pick a single food vendor and give them a regional monopoly within, say, Yellowstone, where they're the only ones that can sell food or beverages. Um, Red Rock almost certainly has the same type of vendor. On another scale, there's also a license that the federal government can provide. As many of you probably know, the federal government owns most of the land in Nevada, and sometimes they'll license out the right to mine, say, lithium from a certain location in Nevada. That company has a monopoly on that particular function within a particular geographic area. Industrial organization um, also sometimes prevents uh, firms from setting up within a market. Uh, the best example of this is like national sports leagues, professional sports leagues. There are a lot of exemptions given to say Major League Baseball or hockey um, that allows them to partake in some rather monopolistic behavior. For example, national, uh, the NHL, the National Hockey League, has set it up to where the Golden Knights have a regional mon monopoly on professional hockey here in the Las Vegas Valley. Normally, that would be something that would get broken up or have government involvement, but we've made a lot of legal exceptions for professional sports in particular to allow them to create those types of monopolies. So, let's say we are a company and we have some type of monopoly. We have a monopoly on our foot fungus drug. Okay, we still have decisions to make just because it's not like the game where you own everything, therefore you win. It's it's still a decision that needs to be made on how to best leverage that monopoly. So monopolists are going to be looking to make the most money possible, right? They want to make profits. So they're going to have to figure out output. They're going to have to figure out price. Um, usually they can only control one or the other. There is a problem, however. Monopolists still have to abide by the law of demand. Just because we control the whole market doesn't mean consumers are going to behave any differently. So the law of demand, as you'll recall, it's this graph here on the right, states that as price goes up, demand goes down. And this makes a lot of sense, right? At $50, um, somebody with some gnarly foot fungus might want to come buy our foot fungus uh, drug. But at $500, maybe they can't afford it, or maybe they're no longer interested at that price point. The law of demand is in effect, even though we're the only ones with that foot fungus drug. So how does a monopolist decide what price point to target or what output level to target? Usually what they're going to look for is the price or the, um, the level of output where marginal revenue or the amount that's being made per, uh, on the next unit sold is equal to marginal costs or the cost it, it, that was required to produce the unit. So this is true for a purely competitive market. It's true for a monopolistic market. The big difference is that in a purely competitive market, marginal revenue is the same as price. So the amount they make is the exact same as the price point uh, within the market itself. And every single firm is receiving the same price no matter how much it produces, because if they lower production, someone will pick it up. If they raise production, someone will drop it. Neither of these assumptions are true in a, monop uh, in a monopolistic setting. So in this monopolistic setting where we have control over price and we can cut the price to sell more, we could actually make it to where marginal revenue is less. 
than price. In a purely competitive market, the price would not drop at all as output inc is increased, so marginal revenue would remain at the same price. The firm's total revenue would increase at a steady rate with production. A monopolist will choose the output that yields the highest profits. So this is the point where marginal revenue is exactly equal to marginal cost, as I mentioned before. And the, the way to think about this is, as you are producing more and more units, marginal revenue will be higher than marginal cost. And the gap between those two is your profit or your profit margin. So you produce one unit and your profits, uh, let's say it costs you $4 to make it and you made $6 marginal revenue, right? Marginal cost is $4, marginal revenue is $6. That gap, that $2 gap is profit. The next unit you, rent and you produce, marginal cost goes up a dollar. So you spend five dollars to make the unit you can still sell it for six dollars your profits one dollar the next unit you make your cost is six dollars marginal revenue is equal to marginal cost they're both six dollars so you break even you didn't make money you didn't lose money if you made one more unit your cost might go up again to seven dollars so now it costs you seven dollars you only made six you're in the red right you lost a dollar so when you stop at that point where marginal cost equals marginal revenue, that means every unit produced before was giving you some type of profit, or at least a large amount of units produced before was giving you some type of profit. You broke even on that last one, and you stopped before you made any units you would lose money on. So next up, we're going to talk about this idea of price discrimination. Now, price discrimination is not unique to monopolies, and we'll talk a little bit about that later in the lesson. But monopolists have a lot of market power that allows them to exploit consumers, um, particularly through price discrimination. So in some cases, the monopolist can divide up consumers into two or more groups and charge a different price to each group. And this is what's known as price discrimination. It's why when you go to the movies, maybe if you go with grandma or grandpa, right, you have to pay $15, but grandma and grandpa only have to pay 8 Or if you go with mom and dad and you're still under 18, maybe you have to, maybe your mom and dad have to pay $15 for themselves and you're only 7 because you're a child. The idea is based on trying to get a maximum price from each possible consumer, right? The absolute most they are willing to pay. If we go back to our pharmaceutical example with the foot fungus, one company, uh, one co pardon me, one customer might come in and we might say, okay, we somehow know this person will only pay $50 for our foot fungus drug. So we charge them $50. Then Kanye West walks in and we're like, Kanye West will pay $5,000 Otherwise, we're going to go tell TMZ, right? So we, we can charge him more. We can discriminate based on how much they are willing to pay because we know they're in different economic circumstances or different like socio circumstances or, or something is driving them to pay more for our good or service. So if, if we were able to do it that effectively, where every single customer walked through that walked through the door, we knew exactly how much they were willing to pay. That would be the ideal situation because we could make as much profit as possible based off of each individual consumer. We will get the exact amount of money you're willing to pay, no more, no less. So obviously it doesn't really work like this in the real world. We, we would segment or break these customer groups up into, into different, um, different groups based on what we thought their group would behave like. For example, we might think that adults are willing to pay $15. Adults with kids are not willing to pay $15 to bring their kids, but they might be willing to pay $8 to bring their kids. So we can target the adults at $15 and the children at $8 for the, the movie or whatever it is we're, we're selling. And as I mentioned before, price discrimination is a feature of a monopoly, but it's really something that can be practiced by any company with market power. For example, the movie theaters don't have a monopoly. They might have a monopoly in like the strictest sense of the word, like a monopoly on that street, right? But usually there's within driving distance, two or three or five or 10 movie theaters you can go visit. Yet they all are able to charge different rates for different customers because they have a little bit of market power. It's inconvenient to have to drive halfway across town. Uh, another example, oh, this is this is pretty similar to what we were talking about, actually, um, with the 
ski lift passes. I don't know if you guys have been skiing or snowboarding or if you've been up to Mount Charleston, but they always have these crazy different rates based on, on different groups of people, right? You'll see like veterans, children, adults, seniors, and they're all different prices. That's also uh, another way of price or another way of practicing price discrimination. So again, um, yeah, so again, the the practice of price discrimination is to try and ex or extract as much possible money from each consumer. Um, it's impractical to try and do price discrimination on a one-to-one -one level. So they usually design pricing policies for groups, like I said, with adults and seniors and children. Um, and then it's the way that they base the pricing is off the expected behavior of the group since they can't target the individual individually. So some, some other ways price discrimination occurs in a totally legal manner, might I add. Um, probably should have prefaced this with um, mentioning this is all legal, but price discrimination, even though it's got the word discrimination on it, is, is not necessarily a bad thing. Like all companies to one extent or another, do it outside of purely competitive, or in some case, oligopic or oligopolies. Um, some examples would include like airfare. They might say like, okay, if you're gonna buy tickets way ahead of time, we'll give you a discount. If you're gonna buy tickets like in that one to two week period where a lot of businesses are buying tickets for business travel, we're gonna charge full rate. And then if you're willing to wait until the last second, we might lower the price drastically because we're just trying to fill planes at this point and we're, we're targeting those consumers that are looking for the best deal. Um, other examples include like the senior citizen or student discounts I mentioned, grouping by children or veterans or teachers in a lot of cases, manufacturers rebate offers where they say, oh, hey, buy the product and then if you mail us, we'll give you a discount. They say all oh, the people that are willing to pay full price won't even bother with mailing it in. The people that are looking to get that discount will buy it and then mail in for the discount. So for price discrimination to work, a market has to have met three conditions that firms that use price discrimination also have some market power, right? So in a purely competitive market, you have no market power, you have no control over the price. You, you can't discriminate based on price. You also have to be able to divide consumers up into distinct groups. If you're selling corn to retailers and your your business is solely built around selling to like like either a distributor or individual retailers, you can't really discriminate based on any measurable characteristic. Whereas if you're selling movie tickets, you can reasonably say like, hey, people might not come out if they have kids unless we lower the price for kids. People might not bother to come out uh, during retirement unless we lower the price for seniors and retirees. And then last but not least, buyers can't be in a position where they can easily resell that good or service. So going back to our corn example, if I target an individual uh, retailer and offer them some kind of discount, um, they, they have the freedom to pump that right back into the market where you, you can't easily resell a movie ticket that is for seniors to um, an adult, right? It says right there, for seniors only and also you're buying it a couple minutes before going into the movie it doesn't make a lot of sense to set up like a black market in an alley somewhere trying to scalp movie tickets <laughs> uh hoping hoping that you can bypass some type of security and that you can buy them ahead of time and find a buyer prior to the movie starting so the last concept we need to talk about is predatory pricing. And that's why I've got the mountain lion on here. I'm sure you had questions about the mountain lion. First of all, mountain lions are like the apex predator of like the Las Vegas area, right? Like if you are ever hiking and you see a mountain lion off, to, off in the distance, pro tip, don't go pet the mountain lion. You should turn around. Don't run though. Don't run. If it sees you, you gotta be, you gotta be confident. You gotta be strong, make some noise. If it doesn't see you, go back to your car. The reason the mountain lions here is because, like I said, they're an apex predator. And a lot of companies with market power will have that same predatory, predatory instinct, right? To try and push other firms out, to destroy other firms. And they do this by changing their price to such a low level that it pushes other competitors out of the market. Um, a video we were going to watch that I, I'm not going to show in this presentation, but you can watch at the end of the presentation, actually talks about how Microsoft used the idea of predatory pricing to try and push out other web browsers. So in the 90s, there was Netscape. 
uh, Netscape Navigator was what it was called. And it was the premier tool for getting online. There was also like AOL and a couple of other competitors, but Netscape was the one. And they charged like 50 bucks for their browser. Microsoft, being this massive behemoth of a company, was able to fund building a web browser and giving it away for free with all of its operating systems. So by, in effect, making Internet Explorer their web browser free, they had lowered the price so much that there was no way Netscape could compete with them. And this ultimately led to a lot of antitrust legislation. It was a big deal in the late 90s, early 2000s, um, that people felt this was a monopolistic behavior. Microsoft was trying to gain a monopoly on the web browser industry or the web browser market. And once Netscape got pushed out, they would raise the price up to $1,000 for their web browser and they'd be the only one that supplied it. It's that type of predatory instinct that like that being out for blood like the mountain lion that a lot of people will frown upon or a lot of economists or government regulators will frown upon uh, when they see coming from a firm with a lot of uh, market power. All right. Well, that's it. This is the video. If you guys are curious, it is a great video. It talks all about the monopolistic behavior of Microsoft in the 90s. Um, again, none of this is required, guys. I'm doing this for you so you have something. Um, I know I'm making a bunch of cheesy jokes and lame jokes, and I probably sound like I'm trying too hard, but um, I figure it's better than nothing. So hopefully you enjoyed it. I will try and get some more content up tomorrow, maybe over the weekend, certainly on Monday, and uh, we'll go from there. Uh, have a safe day, everyone. If you have questions, give me a comment. Oh, and if you haven't taken the survey, please take the survey. If you know someone that might be interested in some more content um, that hasn't taken the survey, ask them to take it. It takes all of two minutes. That way I know what you guys want to see so I can make it. <laughs> all right. Thank you so much, everybody. Uh, I will talk to you soon, and have a good one. Bye-bye.